Good evening, everyone. I'm Ashwat, event coordinator at GDSC JSSSQ. I hope you had a great day, but I assure you, the evening is going to be even better. The team welcomes you to session one of Compose Camp, Introduction to Kotlin, presented to you by Manjuna, our Flutter lead, and Nehal, our EC lead. I encourage the attendees for active participation and not refrain from asking doubts by turning on their mics or in the chat box when requested to do so. The slides of the presentation will be shared. Now, here's Nehal to tell you about Kotlin Basics. Hello, everyone. I'm Nehal Parikh, currently the event coordinations lead at GDSC JSS STU. Hope you all are having a very good evening. I know you guys just can't stop to begin your journey in the world of Android. So do I. So let's just start right away. Yeah, so there we go. I know you guys might have a lot of questions. Like, if you already have Java, then why would we or someone else go for Kotlin to just develop you know, Android apps? So I know the question is very common and none, none, most of you know, like, why do we use Kotlin? So here we have the answer for this. So yes, when it comes to Kotlin programming language, firstly, the codes that we use in this language are very much concise. So you don't need to write like lines and lines of codes just to execute a very simple function. And coming to next, if you are new to programming and know not even the basics of programming, then fret not, because this language is easily readable, even if you are new to any of the programs. And yes, it is very crisp. As I said earlier, you don't have to write multiple lines of codes just to execute even the simplest function. So that's the first one. And moving on next, if you are a person who is object oriented, then welcome to Kotlin. This language is just meant for people like you, because we use the concept of objects here as well because it is an object-oriented program. And yes, function plays a very integral role when it comes to Kotlin. So if you have already built up a function or you have a predefined function with you, so that makes your work much more easier to write a program. And it also helps you to reduce the number of code lines. So that's the second one. And coming to the last one, which is the most important one. I know when it comes to coding, the security and safety of the code is very, very important. So worry not, because the compiler is going to keep your code at the safest level. So yes, these are the advantages of Kotlin over Java. And I'm sure now you would definitely go for Kotlin rather than Java after seeing the advantages we have of Kotlin over Java. So moving on next. Uh, yes, so any other programming language, even in Kotlin, variables play a very, very important part. So if you want to declare anything, be it an integer, a string, a character, or a constant, the Kotlin variables are here to help you out. So broadly classifying, Kotlin variables are basically classified into two major types, the first one being immutable and the second one being mutable. OK, so over here, let's just consider the example we've studied earlier in chemistry, that is of thermoplastic and thermosetting plastic. We all know that setting plastic, once it's set, we can't remold it. Even after heating a number of times, that is not possible. So basically, immutable is just a replica of thermosetting plastic. Because if you just assign the value to a variable once, you just can't change the value of it anywhere in the program. So yes, immutable. The simple terms we can define it is once the value is assigned, you cannot reassign it. And coming to the mutable variables, mutable variables are just like thermoplastics. You can remold it a number of times. So if you just assign initially a value to a mutable variable, in the upcoming code, if you just want to try to you know, alter the value of it, you can do it easily. So the major difference we have between immutable and mutable is that the keyword. So in mutable, we use the keyword VAL, and that cannot be reassigned. And coming to mutable, we have the keyword VAR. And if you use the keyword VAR, congratulations, you can reassign the values any number of times. So let's just have a brief look at the difference between VAL and VAR, VAL and VAR, in terms of a simple program. OK, so let's just consider initially the name of a person is Joseph. 
So if a person wants to change his name from Joseph to Cody, if that person uses well as his variable, he can't do it because as we said, it's a type of thermosetting plastic. We can't remold it, neither reassign it. So when you try doing it with the keyword VAL, I'm sorry, you cannot reassign it because you'll have an error in the code. Uh, if you do the same using the keyword VAR, where so initially, if the person's name is Joseph, and if he wants to change it to Cody, it is done successfully because VAR can be reassigned. So that is the concept we have in Val versus Val. So that is about the variables we have in Kotlin. And moving on next, the data types. Obviously, coming to any of the program data types are more and more efficient. If you just want to declare or assign the memory space of any of the variables you're using in the program, so data types comes to your rescue. So broadly, it is classified into four types. That is integer, floating, Boolean, and character. So if you've studied this earlier in C or C++, fret not, this is going to be really easy for you to deal with the data types of Kotlin as well. So yes, let's just have a look at them one by one. So yes, if we start with integer data types, so if you just want to store a value which has no decimal part in it, so there you go with integer data types. And integer data types are classified into various types. Uh, it depends on the amount of memory you want to give to your variable. And let me just remind you, the more the uh, memory it uses, the more time it takes to compile. So depending on what the value you're using and what's the range of it, depending on that, we just assign the integers into different types. We have basically four types of them. Uh, if you have a very short variable to store, you can go with byte because Byte just consists of eight bits. And if it's a very small number, byte is always there for you. And if it's just a bit more, uh, the range is just a bit more than byte, then there goes short. Short has 16 bits. And if it's a bit more than that, you use the keyword in to store any number of uh, digits in 32 bit storage. And if your integer number is quite long, then you can go with long because long has 64 bits of memory. and uh, long uses the maximum amount of memory space to store your value. So if your number is really great, and if it's an integer, you can go with long anytime. So that is of integer data types. Now, moving on next, we have the floating point data types. So as we know, integer can't store any decimal value. So if you want to do it, so there you'll go with floating point data types. So floating point data types is again of two types, float and double. So the major difference between them is the memory storing capacity of them. So float uses 32 bits and double uses 64 bits. So if your uh, floating point number is like really long, then you can go for double or else float is always there for you. So this is our floating point data types. And moving next, we have the Boolean data types. OK, so basically, it just stores one bit of memory. And it can either just say true or false. So if we just look into the example which we have, so basically, function main is an inbuilt function which is already there in Kotlin. And just let me just remind you, whichever program you start in Kotlin, it should always have a main function in it. Just the way we have void main in C, C++, that is how we'll have function that's the main function in the Kotlin program. So over here, we are just assigning x as value 10 and y as value 9. And since it's it has the keyword val, it cannot be reassigned. So we don't even have to reassign over here, so it's fine. So if we just check the condition, if x is greater than y, so yes, 10 is greater than 9. So obviously, your value over here would be true. And since it's Boolean, we just have one bit. It's either true or it's false. So that is of Boolean type. So moving on next, we have the character data type. So if you want to store a character, be it A to Z in caps or in smalls or numbers from 0, zero to 9 or any specific symbols like asterisk, hashtag, etc. So that is why you'll make use of character data type. And the keyword we use for character data type is char char. So again, looking into the, mem uh, the function of it, we'll just start with the main function. And moving on next, our variable over here is migrate. So migrate being a val keyword variable, it cannot be reassigned. 
so yes char it's of type character and it has the value in it as b and character always has the value within single inverted comma that is to be noted always so if we just try to print the value of this thing we'll get the output as b so this is the character data type and so yeah this is all we'll have for data types and moving on next that is string interpolation it is a very important concept when it comes to kotlin and basically it's nothing but just the concatenation of two strings if you've studied earlier the concat the concatenation of strings in c or c++ it is almost the same we'll have in kotlin as well so concatenation is nothing but just merging of two strings for example you have string s1 and string s2 if you just want to concatenate that that is the concept of string interpolation that you have in kotlin so let's just have a quick view to an example of this so yes we are using two variables over here a and b with the values a 10 and 5 so we can perform various operations because it is integer and integers can also be used with string interpolation because string is just a series of characters so never mind you can use integers as well because it's not just spe specified to any characters or a particular string with so many number of characters or anything you can anytime go with int or float or anything string interpolation works well with every data types so yes if you just try summing up or subtracting multiplying dividing this for the values a and b we would have the output something like Yes, addition gives 10 plus 5, 15. Subtraction gives 5. Multiplication gives you 50. And division gives you 10 by 5. That is equal to 2. So string interpolation can come to your rescue even for calculation of values. So that is string interpolation. And moving on, next, operators. Yes. So performing any operation is a very specific task, be it in any of the programming language. So again, in Kotlin, operators are forms a very, very major and integral part of the program. So yes, if you want to perform any of the operations, operators are always there. And it's not just one or two operators. We have basically six types of operators, starting with arithmetic operator, relational operator, assignment operator, unary operator, logical operator, and lastly, the bitwise operator. So different operators are used to perform different tasks. So right now, we will just be seeing arithmetic, relational, and assignment operators quite deeply because that will help you again with the programs you'll be creating for the compose scan. So yes, arithmetic operators. So just like the other programming languages, we have addition, subtraction, the modulus function, multiplication, and the division. So if you just look into addition, you have the plus symbol, which is used for addition. Subtraction, it is minus. And coming to multiplication, it's quite different because it's not just the normal asterisk mark we use for any other programming languages. It is the variable dot times multiplied by the another variable that we are going to be using in this function. So yes, for multiplication, you have to use dot times to multiply it. And division is normal division as of any other programs. And coming to the modulus function, yes, again, just the way we've done it for multiplication. Uh, instead of dot times over here, what we do is we just use the concept of dot remainder that is dot rdm to get the remainder of a when divided by b so that is how the arithmetic operators work so yes the output would be something like this if we have the variables 20 and 4 the addition subtraction multiplication division and the modulus would be this for the values we've used currently so yes that is all we have for arithmetic operators and now coming to the relational operators basically all of us just want to know the relation between two variables like if we have two variables a c and d in this case and we just assign the values to them as 30 and 40 respectively if we just want to check out which is greater or which is lesser if they are equal or not so we just use the concept of relational operators so yes if you want to see if it's greater than we have the normal greater than symbol for kotlin if you want to see less than, then we just use C dot compare to D. If it's less than zero, then it gives true. And if it's not, then that will return false. And if you want to see greater than or equal to, again, you have the same concept as of other programming languages. It's greater than, greater than or equal to. Coming to less than or equal to, again, you'll have to use dot compare to. And 
that would be in between the two variables we would be using. So if you want to see the equality, we just have the normal double equal sign to check the equality of them. And if you want to see if they are equal or not, you'll have to use this concept. It's question mark dot equal s. That is question mark dot equals. So if it's going to be true, then you'll have a true value. And if it's not, then you'll have the false value. So let's just check out the output we would have for this. So yes, 30 greater than 40, it's false, yeah. So is it less than? So yes, it's true. Gre greater than or equal to? Nope, it's not. It's less than, so this would return true. And if you see if 30 and 40 are equal, no, they are not. So for the equality condition, you would get a false. And if you check if they are not equal, so yes, 30 and 30 is not equal to 40. So obviously, you'll get a true for this. So this is all for relational operators. And moving on next, we have the assignment operators. So assignment operators is nothing but just a shortened version of arithmetic operators. So if you just want to give the value for, uh, let's just say we have A and B. So if you want to just assign the value for A as A is equal to A plus B. So assignment operators would look something like a plus is equal to B, which is almost the same as A is equal to A plus B. And if you want to try the subtraction for it, instead of A is equal to A minus B, you just use A minus is equal to B. So yes, that is how it goes. And if you just see the output of this, just like normal addition, 10 and 5, 10 plus 5, that would be 15. And the subtraction would give you 10, 15, 10, and 0 for the other operations we've performed. So yes, this is all we'll have for the operators. And yes, coming to the control statements. I know most of you would be worrying that why control statements? It's kind of complicated. Why do we even use it? So if you have any questions as such, uh, let me just tell you, control statements are very, very important for any program because every program depends on various conditions. And depending on that conditions, most of the times we just decide the output, whether the out should, output should be true or false or some other value. So yeah, we'll have mainly four types of control statements talking off in this discussion. So starting with if, we'll have if, then we'll have if else, we'll have if else if, and lastly, we'll have the when condition. And when condition is specifically for Kotlin in this case. So let's just look into them one by one. So yeah, coming to if expression, taking the example of this program, we'll just assign the value to A as 3. Next, we'll check if A is greater than 0. So is 3 greater than 0? It will be the output you'll get for this is, yes, the number is positive. And instead of A, it, instead of 3, if it would have been anything below 0, you would get nothing. Because we are just mentioning one case over here, only if it's greater than. So if it would be less than, you would get no output. Mostly, we would get an error for this because it's just one condition we are checking over here. So 3 is greater than 0, yes, the condition is satisfied. So the output would be, yes, number is positive. So this is the if expression. And if we have a condition to check with another condition, then we'll have the use of if else expression. So talking of this example, we have two variables over here, a and b, uh, with the values 5 and 10 respectively. So if we just check if a is greater than b, uh, we would have the output something as number 5 is larger than 10. And if it's not the case, then we would have the output as number 10 is larger than 5. So taking into account the current values, 5 and 10 is 5 greater than 10. So the if condition falls over here because 5 cannot be greater than 10. So the program statement control goes over to the else part. So over here, uh, since 5 is not greater than 10, we'll have this as the output, that number 10 is larger than 5, because 5 is less than 10. So yes, our output would be number 10 is larger than 5 for the current case. So yes, this is the if-else expression. And moving on next, we have the if-else if ladder. So if we have multiple conditions to be checked, like if you just use three variables, A, B, and C, uh, initially we can just have if A greater than B, a particular set to be... Uh, instructed and if not if it goes to false we'll have a particular another set of instructions which, which will have the next control of the flow of that program so if we just look into this example we have a number with the value five so if we just given any other number say its result if that number for example 10 if 10 is greater than zero we would have it as positive number 
if not then that would be a negative number and if it's neither positive nor negative then we would have the output as zero so yes at the end we can just print the result as number is dollar symbol and yes to assign the value for anything any integer floating point or any of the variables we are using in our program the dollar symbol plays a major part it's the normal syntax is dollar with your variable name so that is how the output works for the println function so yes this is of if else if ladder and yeah since I said when condition is exclusively for Kotlin, so when condition is nothing but the normal switch statement that we see or that we've used in any other programming languages. So looking into the example over here for the switch statement thing, we have two variables, variable one and variable two with the values 27 and 22. So if we just perform, if we want to perform any of these expressions over here, operations that is plus minus into or division. So basically, we just use another variable operator that just reads the line which we would be just writing out. And calculated is our another variable which we are using along with the when condition when operator. So operator can be any from plus, minus, asterisk, or the division one. So when the particular operator appears mm -hmm. over here, we'll just be performing the respective operations depending on that. So if the symbol is none from these, so uh, eventually it will go for the else statement part. So if it's a symbol, anything apart from this, you'll have an error over there. So yes, that would be an invalid operator. So yes, this, this would be the output we would be getting. So this is just an example output for the particular program we mentioned over here. So if we just meant, uh, put in the key, uh, the symbol as plus, so it would be 27 plus 22, which is the first one, variable one plus variable two. So that would add up, that would sum up. And the output would be the result of a calculation is dollar calculator. That is the value that will be assigned to the variable VAL calculator. And that would be 49. So yes, this is a switch type of condition, which we use exclusively for Kotlin. So yes, these are mainly the things, the control statements we would have in the Kotlin language. So yes, again, coming to the operators part, we have two operators that are mainly and again, exclusively just for Kotlin. Those are the in and dot dot operator. So yes, they are quite different in their way of operation. So when it comes to the in operator, so in Kotlin, yes, it is just used to check if a particular value exists in that range. So if it does, the condition is satisfied. And if it doesn't, it gives out a false value. So that is of the in operator. And coming to the dot dot operator, so yes, if you just want to mention a range of a number from 5 to 50, for example, so you just don't have to write down all the numbers 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. up to 50. It just works the way that you just write 5 dot dot 50. And yes, you're done with your part. So we'll just be looking into an example program for these operators uh, once I'm done with the next part. So yes, next we'll have, yes, the loops. So again, if we just want to check in the condition um, and we just want to iterate our statement a number of times for a particular condition. So that is where we would use while and for loops. So while loop is basically a block of code uh, that has a particular set of statements in it. So if that just keeps on repeating until the condition becomes false, because every time the condition we check in, if it's true, it goes on iterating, iterating until the condition becomes false. And when it becomes false, the flow of the program eventually moves to the next part of the statement and coming out of that block of codes. So that is while and for loop, yes, it's quite similar in functioning, but it's quite different from that that we use in Java and C. So we can just have a look into the examples for while and for loop. So, yep. Yeah, so coming firstly to the expression we'll have. So yes, function main. And yes, curly braces again, they are very important part in any of the particular operations that we want to just perform inside. So yeah.
if we just first look into the while statement, we'll just have an example as variable with uh, the name as n, and we'll just assign the value to it as one. So if we just check out the condition while n is less than or equal to 10, so again, we'll have to give out a particular condition that if it's true, we'll have a particular set of statement or a single statement that we would want to execute. So yes, uh, if you just see over here, while n is less than or equal to 10, print ln n. So that would particular keep iterating until the condition becomes false. So let's just make it n plus plus. And now if we just try running the program, yeah, so we can just see over here that we just started with one and as we go on and on and on, it ends at 10 and at 10, the condition 10 less than or equal to 10 becomes false because after 10, we have 11. So 11 is greater than 10. So this, the statement just becomes false over here and again, that comes to the end of the program for this condition. So this is what while loop looks like and this is how it works. So if we just use this for the case of for statement, uh, we can just mention it like for i in five dot dot tens range. So yes, this is where we make use of the dot dot operator as I mentioned earlier. So we just don't have to mention all the numbers from five to 10, that is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So if we just do this, it works well. So yes, we'll have to execute a particular line for this. So we can just give it as print um, within double inverted commas, the symbol dollar and I. So our output would be something like, Yes, so if we just give a space between this, it would be much more clear. So yeah, within a range of five to 10, we'll have the output as five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So yes, this is the working of while and for loops. And yes, we've made the use of dotted operator as well for this condition. So let's move back to our Yes, so if we just move back to our loops part, so that would be the end of loops. We are done with while and for loops. And moving on next, yes. So functions is, as I said earlier, function is a very integral part when it comes to performance of any of a particular set of statements being in any programming language. And since Kotlin uses the concept of functions, it makes our work much and much more easier because we can just, you know, uh, previously define a particular set of statements and name that as a function. So when we just call in the function, that set is automatically exec executed without uh, us working much hard on that. So yes, it performs a specific task. And there are mainly two types of functions that we use in Kotlin. That is the standard library function, which is already pre-built in the language itself. And the second one being the user-defined function. Uh, a user-defined function is basically the one which uh, we build up and which we just use to perform any of the tasks we want to. So yes, and those are not previously defined. Those are the ones which we create. So coming to the standard library functions, we have various functions like the function main function. Yeah, so the main function, which is very important and very much required to perform any of a particular task that comes under the standard library function, including the functions like square root function, println, et cetera, et cetera. So all those are the standard library functions. So yes, again, coming to the parameters part of it, parameters are very, very important when it comes to functions. So yes, a function parameter, it is defined using the notation, something like name um, colon type. So they are, they are separated by using comma. So if we just look into this example over here, we have a function. This is a user defined function, which we have as student. So if we just uh, have this function along with the name as string, which has the value Lucifer, then the standard or the class he's studying in, again, it's a string because it has characters in it. 
So it will be 9. And coming to roll number being an integer, it will have the value as 11. So we'll just try executing this function and see what happens if we just execute it in actual way. Yes, so um, starting with the function name, we have the function student over here. So that would something be like Yes, so just a second. I think I have an error executing this. So never mind, we'll just look into the example we have over here itself. So yes, if we just look into the function, we have it over here. So it has the name as Lucifer, the standard is 9, the roll number is 11. And if we just try executing the and if we just try executing to get the output of this, we'll have it as name of the student is dollar name. So you'll have the output as Lucifer over here. If you just go for the standard of the student, you'll have dollar standard. That is, you'll have ninth. Sorry, this is, yeah, it's ninth. So that would be the class Lucifer is studying in as per in this case with a roll number that is dollar roll number as 11. So this is our user defined function right now. So if we just try calling this user defined function within our main function, so this is how it looks like. It is the main function. And since uh, we are calling parameters over here, so this would be how it should look like, array with the symbols and the string. So yes, uh, we'll use the keyword VAL over here. It is because we don't want the value of the name or the standard or the roll number of the student to be changed anywhere. So yes, if we just use these keywords along with the variable, and let me just remind you, the variable you use over here should be different from the variable you use over here. So if we are using name over here, it should have a little variations, like it should be name of student. And since you're using standard over here, we'll make it a bit altered, like standard of student. And the roll number again altered to roll number of student. So that would be 25. So over here, we are just calling the function student so since we are passing no arguments, so this would directly by default take in these values over here. So yes, this is of default arguments. And if we see the same arguments in case of passing the arguments, the function is same. Like we have the same values for Lucifer, the standard, and the roll number of Lucifer. So this is the same function we earlier used of. So if we use them again in the main function, we just use them with the keyword VAL. So VAL name of student, standard of student, and roll number of student. So over here, we are just trying to change the values for them. So if we just try student, name of student, and roll number. So this is where we are passing the arguments. So the values we used earlier over here, those would be replaced by the values we are using in the main function. So yes, this is just of a particular single student we are using. So uh, do you guys know how to use it for when it comes to multiple students? Oh shit, I don't know this. I think Manjunath is going to come to our rescue at this point. Manjunath, would you please help us out? Can you help? Sure. Thank you so much. So to solve that issue, We'll look into the solution. Just a minute. So I think uh, my screen is visible, right? Yes, yes, Manjana, it is. Yeah, thank you. So to, the issue was like how to store values of multiple items, right? So to solve that issue, we can use two. Op we have two options. So first is to declare like you will be declaring multiple variables. But the problem with this is that as the number of items grows, this solution is not at all feasible, right? Suppose you want like, uh, suppose if there are 10 students at the beginning, but as the students join in, we need to store data of multiple students. So this is not at all a feasible solution. So the other solution, which is provided by Kotlin, which helps you to handle the same problem intuitively is called as collection. 
so what is this collection so collection is basically some data structure so we come across like we came across this new term right data structure so what is this data structure so data structure is basically a structured way of storing data so as the name suggests collection holds collection of items right so in collection we have various types we we'll look at each of them one one by one so first we have something called as lists so as the definition says it's a generic ordered collection of elements so if you look at this term generic what it represents is you can have list of integers you can have list of strings or you can have list of booleans which makes it generic you can store any type of data using this list but one thing is the list stores only um, items of similar data types so each element of the list it can be called as you know elements or items so behind the scenes each of these elements are stored in a numbered for numbered list and this numbering starts from zero so 23 has been assigned with index zero and in the programming terms we call it as index and 34 has been assigned with index one and so on right so what is the size of the list so size of the list is basically the total number of items in the list so here in this list we have seven items right 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 so size of the list is 7 but if you see here the index last index element of elements last index is 6 right since the indexing starts from 0 last elements index will be 6 okay so how to declare this list so in list we have two types so basically we have mutable list and immutable list so if you remember while talking about variables we had two two types right variable val var var so val is basically immutable var is basically used to is a mutable variable right in even in list we have similar sort like we will declare immutable list by using just this keyword list of so we'll see this uh, through some demo so say i want to declare a val my list say i want to declare a immutable list so immutable list the keyword is list of say i want to declare a list of you know integers so i'll type in so after specifying this keyword you will open the small braces and in that you specify the list of the elements so here i have one comma 2 and comma 3 so you will be separating each of the elements using this comma right so let's try to print this list so if you print it yeah so the list has been created successfully so okay next we have something called as mutable list right so immutable list is similar but instead of using just list of we will be using mutable and this l will become capital so we will see the difference between immutable list and mutable list in the upcoming slides so this is how we declare immutable list okay so next we have something called as initializing list right so just now we saw like how this is how we will declare a uh, immutable list and to initialize the list you will be specifying the items of the list within this small braces and each of the item will be separated by these commas right so how will you declare it so if you observe one thing even though it is a list of integers we have not at all specified like this is a list of integers so that's the beauty of kotlin kotlin automatically understands like the type of the item that a list will be storing so guess the thing but if you want to declare an empty list you can go something like my list 1 is equal to say i want to declare an immutable list i'll go like this right so let's try to run this code yeah so there's some error popping out here so it says not enough information to infer the type variable t so what it means is basically kotlin will know the type of this list during the compilation process right so but in this uh, in this uh, variable we don't know the type of the list right so since it is an empty kotlin is unable to understand like what will be the data type of the items that the list will hold so in order to solve this we need to specify the data type so you know if i will specify the data type and i will try to print a list so i'll type 
total list name of the list my list one so as you can see the code is executing so so the basically here we are initializing the empty list right okay there's some server issue yeah let's try again yeah cool so as we saw this is how we declare a empty list and after declaring the type of the explicitly mentioning the data type of the list we are able to successfully create an empty list right okay so to add elements we will go through the code demo again so how to iterate through the list so since you have like multiple items in the list right you can't access them like going you should go through them one by one that that process of going through each of the elements one by one is called as iterating through the list so to iterate th through the list we will have something okay let's uh, remove this code okay let's say i want to add elements to the list first you should uh, specify the name of the list and then we have some function called as add and uh, after specifying the name of the function and between the uh, small brackets you will be specifying the element that you that you need to add into the list right say i want to add four then i'll copy the same code then i want to add say another element say i want to add five then I want to add another element, say again four. So after adding, so after adding the list will look something like one, two, three, four, five, four. So what this add function does is it basically adds the element to the end of the list, right? So now you, now I want to check like what are the elements in the list. So for that I will iterate through the entire list. So to iterate through the entire list, you we'll specify a for loop. And after opening the braces, you will go like for item in, and you'll specify the name of the list, right? During the each iteration, the val uh, during each iteration, the value of that particular iteration will be stored in this variable item. So we'll uh, print out this item. So let's see. Yeah, as you can see, the list has been updated, and uh, even the uh, element has been added. And we have iterated through the entire list, and this is the final list, right? So, what if you want to remove elements from the list? So, for that, we have another function called as remove. So, first, you need to specify the name of the list, my list, then remove. Then you will specify the element that you need to want, you want to remove. Say, I want to remove the element two. I specify it as true. Then I'll print a list again. So if you run this code, yeah, as you can see, the element two has been removed from the list. So these were the basic operations that you can perform on the list. So we have, okay, so we have one more way of iterating through the list, which is quite intuitive. So that is using, so let's clear out some of the stuff things are getting messy, right? Yeah, okay, I will remove this. Okay, to iterate, we iterated through the for loop. Then now we will iterate through something called as for each loop. This is a quite intuitive way of iterating through the list. So first basically you will specify the name of the list. Then you'll go like for each. But instead of you know opening the small brackets, we open the curly braces, right? So for now, I just uh, print it. I will say, what is this it? So if you see, yeah, the output remains same, right? Even though we you know refactor the code or change the syntax a bit, but the output remains same. So what is this it? Is basically this for each loop will iterate through the every element of the list. During the each iteration, the values of the elements will be stored in some variable, right? We need some variable, right, to store the values. So it will be stored in this uh, default iterator, it. So if say if you want to change this uh, default variable name, so you can go like name. Or since we are iterating through the list of numbers, we will go by the name numbers. And I'll specify the variable name here. And if, again, if I run the code, the output will remain the same. So this is about the forest loop. 
So next we have something called as operations on the list. So as we saw earlier, we added the element using this add function. And within this add function, we we'll specify the element that you want to add to the list, right? And then to remove the elements, we we'll specify something called as remove function. Okay, what if you want to find the index of some element? So in order to find the index of some element, you will be, you'll be using this function called as index of. So let's see the demo. Okay, let's, let's say I want to find the index of this element two. So as we saw earlier, indexing starts from zero, right? So this will be the element with index zero and this will be the element with index one, right? So let's see. The index of the element two is, so again, what is this? We are basically concatenating the strings, right? So I'll go like uh, my list, index of, I want to know the index of this element too, right? So I specify the element two. So if I run this code, yeah, as you can see, as expected, the index of the element two is one, right? Okay, well, what if you want to know the first and last element of the list? So in order to know the first element of the list, we will go like we'll specify the name of the list and then we will call the function called as first. So what is the first element of the list? It is one, right? So what if you want to know the last element of the list? Instead of calling the uh, first function first, we'll call something called as last. So if you run, as you can see, the first element of the list is one and the last element is four, right? Yeah, cool. So this was some of the basic operations that you commonly use while using this list data structure. So next we have something called as sets. So as the definition says, it's a generic unordered collection of elements and it does not contain any duplicate elements. So these are the two important uh, key terms in this whole definition. So what do I mean by generic? As we saw earlier in the list, generic means you can have, you know, set of integers, you can have or you can have a set of strings, or you can have a set of characters, right? But unordered collection means this set doesn't store, you know, elements in the particular order. So it makes this unordered collection of elements. And it does not contain duplicate elements. So to give you a quick demo of this, okay, first we'll clear out all of this code. Okay, let's say now we'll declare some set, my set. And to declare a immutable set, I will I'll be using this function called as set now. Even in set, we have two types of sets, mutable set and immutable set, right? Say I want to declare a immutable set of uh, integers. So as the definition says, set will not contain duplicate elements. So let's say I want to add some element. Wait. Even in set, you will be using the same function add. Say I wanted to add the element four. Then again, I will add the element then I'll add the element five. Then I'll add the element four again. So in list four appear two times, right? But since this is a set, let's see what will happen. So now I'll print this set. Okay. Okay, sorry. Since this is a immutable set, we can't add elements, right? So Immutable means we can't, you know, like change the values. Like once it once it has been in assigned, it's the final. So we need to make this mutable set, right? So I'll make it as mutable, mutable set of now things should work fine. Yeah. So if you see, initially we had one, two, and three, then we added this element four, then we added this element five, and finally we added four. Even though we have added four twice, but in the final output, we are seeing four only once, right? So basically set stores no uh, unique elements. It doesn't contain any repetitions. Yeah, this was about set. So even in set, we'll be iterating through the set using the same way you did for a list. So we basically start with the for loop and to store the values of during each iteration, we use this variable item and this is the in keyword and this is the name of the set. So this is how you iterate through your list and operations on sets. So if you know, or if you are familiar with the operations of the list, then the operations of the sets are quite familiar or quite similar. So in order to add elements to the list or set, you can use this uh, add function 
in order to remove elements from the set, we'll be using this uh, remove function. Okay, so we have next data structure called as maps. So what it says is, it's basically a collection of key value pairs where each key is unique. And it can only be associated with one value. So even though this definition might sound quite complicated, but we will go through an example, then this definition will make complete sense. So first I clear, clear out this code. So say I want to declare a map, val, map. So we will be declaring a, so even in map, in map we have two types, immutable map and mutable map. Since we want to modify a map, I will uh, declare it as, say I will declare some immutable map. So say in map we have two things, key and value. So if you see the definition, it's basically a collection or a list of key value pairs, right? So the first value will correspond to the key. In order to link it to the its corresponding value, we'll use some keyword called as do, do2. Say I want to, you know, relate this uh, integer with its uh, string equivalent. So we'll go like this. So next, in, this will be the key and to link this with its uh, string equivalent, I'll type like this, two, and this is the word two. So for three, I'll specify the key and to link uh, the key to its corresponding value, I'll specify it using the two keyword and then this is the value, three. So if you print out this map, it will go something similar to this. So this is the key and this is the assignment operator. So since it's not basically assignment operator, but it is how, you know, Kotlin prints out the map, that's it. So this is the value of the key, right? So what if you want to declare a empty map? Remember in list, we had to specify the, you know, the data type of the list, right? So even in map, we need to specify the data type or the key and the uh, values the map will be storing. But here we did not, like there's no need of specifying the data type of the key and the values since, you know, Kotlin automatically infers the data type during the compilation time. So to specify the data type of the empty list, empty map, so say I want to, so first uh, data type corresponds to the data type of the key, then we have something. Uh, called a string, this will uh, you know correspond to the data data type of the string, right? Okay, so if you print this empty map, I think we can't use this since we have already used this name map. Okay, we'll rename it to something like map one. Okay, after declaring the map, you should call the map function. Remember, in list we had something like this, right? List of if you want to declare some empty list, you used to do something similar to this, right? So even in map, after specifying the keyword, map of, and sp after specifying the data types of the key and the values, you need to specify the empty braces. So if you run this, yeah, since this is an empty map as expected, so even in the output, we are getting the empty map itself, right? Okay, next we have the, uh, something called as retrieving values from the map. So to demonstrate this, so as we saw, map will basically is a collection of you know key and value pairs, right? So say I wanted to retrieve the values in the map, I will go like uh, the values in the map. Then I'll specify the name of the map. Say I want to retrieve the values of this map with name map. I'll go like map dot values, right? So suppose I want to retrieve the keys. That will the whole thing will remain the same. Okay. I'll copy this and I'll paste it here. So basically retrieve the keys from the map, right? 
So instead of specifying it as values, we specify something called as keys. So let's run this. So if you see the values of this map are one, two, and three, even in the output, we have the same thing. And the keys of the map are one, two, and three in the integer format. And even in the output, we have the same thing. So next we have something called as, okay. So there might arise some situations like, let's say, so there are only three keys, right? One, two, one, two, and three, right? So let's say I want to retrieve a value of the key that doesn't exist in the map. So say like map. Okay, there's one more way to you know retrieve the values of a particular key. So it, you can go like map, map one. So this will basically print one. So let's see what happens. Yeah. So the value corresponding to this key one is this uh, word one, right? So let's say we'll try to retrieve something called as value of the key four. Even though we don't have any key with a uh, key called as four, let's see what happens. Yeah, so since there is no nothing, no key called as four, so it will basically return the null value. But this null, you know, it can be quite, uh, you know, it could potentially crash your app in large applications. So instead of doing this, we can go something like get or default. So it is basically a function provided by the map data structure. So I'll try to get the value of the key four. So if the value of the key four is not present, then return this value zero. So this will be the default value. This will be returned when the corresponding key is not present in the map, right? So I will run this. Okay, there's some um, error. Okay, okay. This should or should be captured. Yeah. So see, the last print statement is even though we don't have the value key a value four, it basically it is basically returning the value zero, right? For the even if even if the key is not present in the list, we we'll just list, uh, return the default value. So this is how you handle things safely in Kotlin. So next we have something called as collection filters. So as the name suggests, it is used to filter out unnecessary things or you know filter th things based on some condition. So here we have a list of strings. So this is the uh, immutable list. Here we have strings like James, Jack, Puneet, and Darshan, right? So I want to uh, you know, retrieve all the strings that starts with the letter J. So for that, I will go something like this, val found. So this will, will be the variable where I will be storing the list or the result that starts with all that will contain strings that starts with letter J, right? So I'll uh, specify the name of the list, my list of names. Then I specify something called as filter. So this is new, right? So after specifying the filter, I specify something like curly braces. So as we saw earlier, so ID is the default parameter or the default iterator provided by the you know for each loop right so even this looks something like for each loop so it will be storing the values of the variables like during each iteration so first iteration the it will contain james so since james is a it's data type is string right so in strings we have some function called as starts with so as the name implies it basically checks whether a particular string starts with a particular character so here we are checking whether a string starts with j does James start with J? Yes, it starts with J. So does Jack starts with the letter J? Yes, even the letter, even the string Jack starts with letter J. Does these two strings, Ponit and Darshan starts with J? No, it doesn't start with J. So let's see, we'll have a quick demo of this. So we'll clear out all of this stuff. Okay, I'll declare a new list. Uh, my list. This top, this is a immutable list. Jack. 
James. Uh, Pune. And lastly, we have Darshan, right? Okay. Since I want to filter this list, my list, after specifying the name of the list, I will type the keyword filter. After specifying the keyword, I will open the curly braces. Yeah. So the default parameter, as we saw earlier, it will be ID. Since each of the uh, item is iterator so string. So it basically string provides some function called a start fit. So I want to check, I want to have a list of all the strings that starts with the letter J. So in order to store the result, I'll store the result in this variable called as val result. So after this, I'll print out the results. So if you run this code, yeah, as, as expected, these are the only strings that starts with a uh, letter J. So even in the output, we have the same thing, right? Uh, so this was regarding the Kotlin basics. I hope you enjoyed the session. So if you have any doubts, you can ask your doubts in the chat box. Thank you, Manjana. The attendees may now clarify their doubts by turning on their mics or putting them in the chat box. We already have a first doubt. If we use if we use remove bracket open four bracket close, which four will it remove if we have multiple fours? Yeah, that is that's a great question. So the remove function basically remove the first occurrence of the you know uh, particular element. So if you want to see the demo, yeah, just change it. Okay, uh, I'll clear out this. Okay, let's say we have James. I'll duplicate this and I'll paste it in the end. I'll remove this. So I want to remove uh, James, right? So I'll print out the, my list. So as I said earlier, so if you run this code, it will okay, we have some error. Okay, since this is a immutable list, we need to make it immutable. Share your screen. Yeah. Okay, share your screen. Yeah, share. Tanishka, to answer your question, I have a code typed out here. So we are having a mutable list, a mutable list of strings, right? Since we are performing modifications on the list, we will be using mutable list. So here I have two instances of the string James. So if I remove this uh, string James, so as you can see, it has removed the first occurrence. So what it does is basically remove, will remove the first occurrence of the particular string. I hope I have clarified your doubt. Yeah, good. So what is the difference between variable and declaration? So second doubt is from Weber. What is the difference between variable declaration, val, and constant? Okay, in Kotlin, I don't think we have something called as constant. So while basically acts like the constant. In C and all, we have this keyword constant, right? But in Kotlin, the, we have only two types, val and var. So val is, you know, basically it is immutable and var is mutable. You can reassign the values multiple times. Another doubt? Where all do we use dollar while printing? Is it only for strings? No, Tanishka, like basically you'll be printing uh, strings, right, in the print statement. So I'll give you an example. Okay, let's say I have a variable called as num one. So you can either print it this way, but what if you want something like this? 
the value of the variable num is num. So what will be the output? If you click, it will just print out the string, right? Even though we have something called as num, it will not at all print the value of this variable. So in order to retrieve the value of this particular variable, we need to use the dollar operator. So if you run this code, yeah, see the num, the value of the variable num is one. So basically, it is used to retrieve the value of the variables. I hope, yeah. So the next question, why do we use val x equal to mutable list of instead of simply using var x equal to list of? Okay, so I think we should get uh, a bit deep into this val and var. Yeah. So what happens is in basically val and var are storing the, you know, okay, I will give you a demo. Yeah. So if you store val of my list, one. So what is your thought? Basically you're saying like, why are we using val instead of val? Yeah, got it. So even though we are storing a mutable list, so let's say we have one, two, three. Okay, since it's a mutable list, we can modify the you know the list, right? Uh, let's say I want to add element four. After adding element four, I'll print out this thing. Okay, if you print out, the element will be added successfully. But it is quite contradictory, right? Right, like. You learned in the earlier part of the session, like val is immutable. But here we are basically modifying the same variable. So here's the thing. What happens is basically this val will store the address of this uh, variable, my list. It's not storing the value. It's actually storing the address. So what I mean is basically let's say the address of the my list variable is my list one variable is 100. OK, let's say I declare another list. Uh, so we we have okay I declare another list my list two so that will be an empty list of the same type integer okay let's try to assign this my list two to the my list one so let's see what happens yeah so as expected yeah we need to remove this. Yeah, so as expected, val cannot be reassigned. So what it says is, you can have a list. So you cannot, you know, change the address that has already been stored in a particular variable. So while my list will basically contain the address hundred, so my list two, my list two variable might have some address like, you know, two hundred. You can't assign this new address to the existing val variable. I think it makes sense. That would be the end of the doubt session. Thank you, Neil and Manjanath. I'm sure this session has helped all students in making tremendous headway and are now a step closer in becoming pro Android developers. Another Compose Camp session will be held soon. So follow us on Instagram and join our Discord server for all updates. Before we conclude this event, I request everyone to give us their valuable feedback on this session, suggestions to improvements, or your thoughts. All are welcome by filling the Google form provided in the chat box. Before we conclude, we do have another doubt. How to ensure null safety in Kotlin? Okay, so Vaibhav Gupta, so it's a bit more advanced concept. So basically, we will have, okay, I think we had some operators. Yeah, I'll just take a look. Relation operations, we have something similar. Just in the present description. Hmm. 
regulation of operations may have something related to null safety yeah so i think my screen is visible right yes yeah so basically null safety we can achieve it using we have several operators among one of them is uh, this question mark operator so what it does is basically it checks whether a variable is null if it is not null it executes this function so let's say this variable c is null you know i can't compare null values with some uh, integer right like null is basically like not defined so it doesn't make any sense so we'll be checking this null safety using this uh, question mark operator there are plenty of operators on null safety i think we can cover this in uh, next session right I hope. Ah, cool. I think that would be all. Please fill the Google form. Provide us your feedback, your thoughts, any suggestions. If they're in the chat box. and definitely make sure you follow us on instagram for updates and on discord the slides of the presentation will be provided thank you